This week on the iRacing Downshift, we're back, for real. It's been how long, Kevin? I think it's been since December. The boys can't seem to get their calendars straight. I'm looking at my phone right now, and I don't have a text, phone call. I thought you'd be a team. And Greg Hill gives us updates we've all been waiting for. Rain is quite the project. It's a whole team initiative. All this and more, so strap in. Welcome to the iRacing Downshift. I'm your host, Greg West. I'm back with the boys, Kevin, Bobbitt, and Chris Leone. Wait, we are back, like really back, as in actually here. It's been how long, Kevin? I think it's been since December. That's been a long time, so... Uh, it's not long enough. <laughs> wow. <laughs> no, it's good to be back. We're going to do more of these, we promise. I think we have calendar reminders. It, we do. It's We've actually scheduled, them. right? <laughs> but we have I had to check out a therapy. I mean, it, it was. It's a, it's been a long time coming. <laughs> and, and Chris has been pushing for this, to be fair. He's been the guy that's like, let's go, and then we find things that get in the way. So yeah, we're going like to do better, lunch. right, Chris? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a reason to do this, because for uh, for this one, uh, we have a sponsor. Uh, this week's iRacing Downshift is brought to you by the butt kicker Gamer Plus, Gamer Pro, and Haptic Connect. Haptic hardware and software that reproduces accurate and powerful sim racing effects, road, tires, gear shifts, and more. Used by professional drivers such as Stefan Wilson, Tommy Milner, and Max Esterson, Buck Kicker can help bring your lap times down. Drive better with Buck Kicker. Visit www.thebuttkicker.com for more information. Yeah, you're right. I did that in one take. That was pretty good. Uh, but that was excellent. I, I'm excited that we have a sponsor. So that's cool. I, I, hey, that means yeah. people are listening, right? Yeah. That's thank great. You. Yeah. Thank you, Buck Kicker. Uh, yeah. A little ego boost for me, but you know. And, and shout <laughs> yeah, out to thank Angela. You to the sponsor. Yeah. We, we got it yeah. in there. Yeah. We did. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. We've been gone for six months. What have we been doing for six months besides developing rain? There's been a lot going on, <laughs> but but for me, I, I've been to a couple of races. It's been awesome. Been back to the track. Been to uh, New Hampshire Motor Speedway for the NASCAR race. Went to Lime Rock for the IMSA race. Um, and I've missed going to races. Um, I love races. I've missed going to races too because I'm looking at my phone right now and I don't have a text, phone call. Smoke signal, email, Slack message, Discord message, Teams invite. I thought you'd be a Teams, and it, oh. that, that never works. <laughs> that so that's never works. Get it. <laughs> yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> well, uh, let's see. Uh, we've been working uh, a, a ton, obviously. Uh, outside of this, I've played a lot of golf. Uh, been been playing a little golf with Kevin. He does He does accept my phone call and invitation to those. If it's kid. about golf, I'm, I'm always available. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, other than that, watching time fly, it's funny when you break a year down in a three month increments, the years go by really quickly and the hair goes gray really quickly. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Chris? What have you been up to? Um, let's see when I'm not playing mobile pinball, because that's, that's my time suck these days. Wait, time out. Is that the oh. go-to mobile game? No, I, I, I just like playing pinball and I'm not going to spend $5,000 to put an actual cabinet in my house. Because we need to spend that money on the air conditioner that's been leaking on the wall. Oh, tough yeah. week to have no air conditioning. Yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was. I was lethargic yesterday. I mean, it was. We Emily and I were just talking about you know those old Sears air conditioning commercials from the nineties. Have I triggered any memories from anybody of no. like watching Nickelodeon? No, 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 not at all. Or, <laughs> your soaps? No. Oh well. Anyway, um, crisis solved. So. But on the iRacing front, obviously, those of you who have downloaded the iRacing Companion app probably get bombarded by notifications from me every single week with all sorts of stories. And then, of course, my uh, my pet series, the iRacing Off-Road Championship Series, has what? been really competitive on what? You you didn't know that didn't I'm know. the off-road guy? I didn't, no? I didn't no know idea. that. You, you like dirt? Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, no. Interesting. News I, to me. I, the more you I know. Like off, I like off-road racing. What can I say? Um how about that? Parts. The companion app. We haven't even talked about that. I'm really, and, but, uh, I lived and breathed companion app for like six months and I completely forgot to mention. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. There's a companion app now. <laughs> yeah. Check it out <laughs> yeah, on cool. the uh, iTunes store uh, and uh, Android store. Yeah. Google play. I guess it's not Apple actually app iTunes store. store. iTunes doesn't exist anymore. Right. It's just the Apple store. Yeah. Apple yeah. App store. Yeah. Yeah, check like it out. It's free. It's cool. Lots of it's fun stuff on there. Easy. You can watch your I rating go up and down and up and down. Or keep like mine, which is just, just down, 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 down. 
Yeah. That's why I just race in leagues right now because you can't get any lower than zero. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, but I'll check let you out. Know, I'm almost there, so. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> check out the iRacing Companion app. Uh, also, check out uh, if you haven't been on logged in the UI recently. A lot of really cool stuff in the UI. A lot of really cool stuff. Quality of life updates in iRacing. That's kind of been the, the name of the game recently. Uh, and yeah. Uh, a hint of things to come. So uh, speaking of, of quality of life updates, we got a, a, a great guest. The guy that's uh, at one of the, at the, what is the helm of the ship? One of them? Is that, is that my nautical yeah. turn? Nautical that sounds turn, good. Correct? Yeah. All right. Executive producer, iRacing, Greg Hill, sat down with Kevin and I, probably reluctantly, last week. Uh, and we had a really great chat on projects that are in development, hints of things to come, and kind of how he got to where he is uh really great discussion looking forward to sharing it with everybody so without further ado uh vice president and executive producer of iRacing greg hill all right kevin and i are excited to have our uh first guest in a while on the on the podcast vice president and executive producer of iRacing also my boss greg hill uh made time to join us today greg thanks for uh for jumping in Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. I am happy to be here and um, happy to kind of give people a glimpse on behind the curtain on some things we're working on, hopefully, uh, and uh, some things that have been going on in iRacing. All right. Well, let's get into it. Let's address the elephant in the room. Uh, during the Spa 24 event, uh, there was a, a situation that pretty much everybody's aware of. A lot of people driving with tires uh, dipped off on the grass, finding advantages in lap times and things of that nature. Uh, we are taking that very seriously, though. and We've already got some initiatives in place, right? Uh, absolutely. Yes, we're taking that very seriously. Unfortunately, we didn't take it seriously enough leading up to the event. Um, I and mean, we knew there was uh, an issue where people could gain an advantage, but we didn't know and we didn't anticipate well enough how much it would be utilized on that weekend. Uh, we could have handled that far better. Uh, we could have done better with messaging. Um, and it really was a, a lesson for us, um, an opportunity for us to, to learn how to approach these things better. Uh, the good news is, I mean, we've taken measures to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Um, we've formed a team here at iRacing who are going to really keep us accountable, uh, keep everybody informed about what's going on in the community, um, about upcoming events where things like this might come into play, and to make sure our developers are doing everything they can uh, to get ahead of these things. Um, Again, unfortunate, We're, we apologize uh, that that happened. Uh, the good thing uh, that's coming out of it though is we've got some fixes and improvements uh, that might not have been made for a while were it not for this. Uh, to start um, the fix uh, in a patch uh, this week, we're gonna be solving, or according to our very intensive testing, solving the issue where uh, an advantage can be made by dipping your tires. Uh, in addition to that, We've learned, um, well, through that thought process, on, we all had different ideas on how we can solve this, right? Um, different approaches, physical, rules-based, uh, et cetera. There were a lot of really cool ideas that didn't necessarily get to the core of fixing the, the problem, with, which we did in the fix that we're patching, but were more like product enhancements. Um, so we're working on some product enhancements that we'll be shipping in our upcoming builds um, with the way essentially the, the tire picks up debris and how punitive debris uh, is on, on your racing when you go off track or uh, for example, what it feels like to physically go off the racetrack um, versus how it is now in iRacing, it's too smooth and it doesn't feel physical enough. So between the, the patch we're putting out now and the improvements we'll be shipping uh, in later builds, uh, we'll end up with a better product. And uh, for sure, we learned how to do things better when it comes to uh, working with the community and communication. Yeah, and I think it's really important for the community to know we take this stuff incredibly seriously. That was a frustrating weekend for us as well as it was for anybody else. 
Um, but the important thing was not to do anything knee jerk, not to do anything that may have felt, have felt good during the moment, but maybe not have been felt as good on Monday and really address the core issue. And with the updates that we're putting out with this patch and the things that we have, you know, pending and future releases that we learned from this, it's, it's going to make the product not just uh, take care of the exploit, but it's actually going to move the product forward. And that's really important and uh, a nice side effect for us doing the deep dive. Um, now, Moving on from things like tire tipping, let's talk about some of the more fun recent develops, developments that we've had because we've had a lot of really exciting projects. Um, you know, the, one of the, the biggest ones that we've worked on uh, for the last year really is the updated Atlanta Motor Speedway and working with NASCAR and the iterative process where uh, how that track really came to be what it is now in reality. It's been a really phenomenal couple of years when it comes to realizing just how valuable this technology we've built up for the last 20 years um, is um, and how well it can be applied to the real world. I mean, we built iRacing and our track building tech capabilities, our car building capabilities um, from the ground up to be as real as possible, authentic physical simulations of the real world. So over the years, we've built up technology that has just been perfectly suited to quickly building racetracks <clears throat> that are realistic and interact with the physics of our race cars in, in realistic ways. And um, when NASCAR and SMI approached us for real, a number of different prototype projects, uh, we quickly identified that these tools that we've been building to make real racetracks uh, in the, the real world using laser scans could also be used to help prototype uh, potential racetracks. Um, we were able to take just general ideas that were being considered verbal ideas and apply those to some of our tracks, in particular Atlanta, like you mentioned, Greg, um, where they just through discussion said, you know, we're thinking of trying a super speedway. We're thinking, oh, let's try 32 degrees of banking. Uh, but we want to keep the walls in the same spot. Um, we pushed back a little and said, you know, that's a lot of banking. Um, maybe we should try a little bit less, but we, we tried both. Um, we ultimately ended up around 28 degrees in our, our first kind of prototype modeling. And this is all just based on like verbal discussions, but we were able to figure out just basically how to create that right banking profile by essentially the trigonometry, uh, working our way through the, the track the existing track and reverse engineering it to match their spec. Uh, once we got some feedback on how that drove, because we're able to instantly drive these tracks using, a, a, of course, iRacing. Uh, so we gathered feedback from our testers and our really skilled uh, VPAs. We call them vehicle production associates. They're basically the aliens on, on, on staff that we have here. So we got their feedback. We got it over to SMI. Um, they incorporated that feedback into an actual like early CAD model of the track. Um, we were able to take that CAD, CAD model and actually directly import it into our tools and build our geometry onto it. So this was like a more advanced stage of prototyping. It's not just verbal. Now we're actually iterating their model. Um, we, we found some problems with that, some bumps, um, some issues that didn't create great racing. So we got them feedback. Uh, the front stretch well, had, had some issues. Turn two had some issues. So they got us another model um, and we built it again. And it's just an iterative process. Um, we're set up so well to do it as well because we, we have those drivers I mentioned. We have the ability to broadcast as everybody knows. So we can show our partners um, racing, like virtual racing, um, and they can see how the tracks race. They can adjust their plans. And it just the, the process throughout the development of Atlanta, I think, was incredibly informative to our partners and um, ended up factoring in significantly to their, their final product, which everybody saw this past month. Uh, That's awesome, Greg. A couple, couple of things that I, uh, to add to that. One is that we have an article that... Uh, Chris Leone did that, you know, really in depth on this process. So if anybody's interested, we can probably put a link in, in uh, the bottom of this or wherever we can put links, right, Greg? And the other thing is 
math, right? You mentioned multiple times math in there, and, and people ask me from time to time, how do I get involved in, in the gaming world or the sim world? And, and math, you know, study math, take math classes. Not something I did, and that's why I work on the marketing side, but if you want to be a developer, I think that's super important and, and worthy of, of sharing. You know, we, we do some programs with STEM and things like that, and, and you know, People, you, you mentioned trigonometry, like, and a lot of basic, kids take that in high school. Basic trigonometry is but they, actually what But they say, said. when will I ever use that? <laughs> well, you could use it making a cool video game or a sim. So uh, just something I found interesting uh, that people may not think of when they think of, oh, I'm just going to go play a game. Absolutely. We've got, I mean, staff members with all sorts of expertise in various areas. I mean, mathematical backgrounds, um, mechanical engineering backgrounds, um, actual just race car uh, knowledge from the real world. Um, just this really great diverse group uh, who have come together, combine all of our knowledge to create this great product. And it's certainly true that nowadays um, people are looking to get into simulation or gaming uh, to eventually become a developer, have more tools at their disposal than they've ever had in the past with uh, I mean, schools dedicated to these fields. and um, it's kind of a, a new age compared to, I mean, when I got into the industry. Well, Atlanta is not the only development project that we've been working with very closely with NASCAR. Uh, we just watched last night, actually, from the time that we're, we're uh, recording this, we had the, uh, the eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing series at Chicago. And that was a big project for us as well. Yeah, how amazing was that? That was similar to our Atlanta project in that it was kind of like initially a skunk works project that we're working on with nascar in this case um, and it went through a real iterative design uh, process that led to us honing in on the layout uh, that you guys saw on the coke broadcast last night and people will see next year in the real world what was different here is that um, we actually went and did some laser scanning um, before prototyping out the layouts and we knew the general neighborhood that NASCAR hoped to run this race in uh, together with the cooperation of uh, Chicago. Um, we knew some prospective roads that they expect they thought might work well for racing, but we weren't sure. So what we did was we sent out a scan crew and we over scanned. We scanned all the roads in that area because uh, we knew we'd have one shot at it and we didn't want to miss a road uh, that turned out to be important. Um, and I'm glad that we did that because um, we ultimately ended up with something very different than the uh, uh, original proposal. Um, and one, an, uh, basically the configuration that we ended up with uh, used those roads uh, that wouldn't have, weren't planned for initially. Um, I think we ended up with a, a far more raceable track. Um, the, and we had a lot of issues to work around once we actually had the, the data um, that led us to make those decisions. It was really hard to know just conceptually how it would play out until we had that data. And we were running uh, our, our testers out on the track, getting speeds for the straightaways, seeing how bumpy the surfaces were, um, understanding how the cars would navigate those bumps or understanding if the city with, with cooperation of NASCAR would actually have to do some some patching of, of some bumpy areas or maybe some trimming of some curbs. So that first, um, that first iteration before the smoothing, I was a very special experience trying to wrestle a, one of the next gen cars around it. Cause we just, you couldn't get grip. You just, it, you were always losing the rear end because you were just bouncing everywhere. It was, it was a wild ride for sure. And um, for one of the bumpier parts was Lakeshore drive which in the original iteration was substantially longer than what we ended up with. So the speeds were higher and it was bumpier. Um, so I, I believe we solved that in, in a decent way. Um, and really the end product is, is awesome. It, watching it last night on the Coke broadcast, it just it looked amazing when they run there in the real world. Next year, it's going to look amazing, and we're just so excited to have worked on the project with NASCAR and to see it finally uh, yield something in the real world that's going to benefit NASCAR and motorsports in general.
Yeah. And once again, we've had so many development projects that have been working in concert with each other. I mean, the one that I guess other one that has really been at the front of mind was the updated Indianapolis road course. Uh, it's an opportunity really to talk about to talk about how exciting it is for that community that's been begging for it, but also maybe to explain, you know, what's coming down the pipe uh, regarding regarding that track. Right. Yeah. Well, um, Indianapolis, getting that out in time for this year's running the kind of the double header, uh, IndyCar and NASCAR were there last weekend, uh, was something we wanted to do. Um, but we didn't have the, the, the staffing available to really jump on it until Atlanta was shipped. And as you guys know, Atlanta was shipped recently and that's a tall order to turn around Indianapolis. And basically we had a month, um, to do so. Um, but we, we took some st strategic approaches that, um, basically gave us the opportunity. Uh, we put all four of our track builders on it, um, modeling small sections and using our track tools, we were able to cobble those pieces together into one larger um, comprehensive track model. Um, we selectively upgraded some of the artwork at the track for the scenery. Uh, we entirely upgraded the drivable surfaces and the, the catch fencing, things like that. And we were able to pull it off um, we shipped the road course uh, in that build. We really had to focus on that. And um, from here on out, we're going to focus on completing the remaining configs and for sure ship the oval in September. Excellent. Well, let's talk a little bit about some upcoming features. I, I would not be able to live down Twitter or the forums if I did not ask you about rain. They, they would not let me sleep. So I've, I've got to ask, where are we at? Well, how's, how are things going uh, in, in the waterworks at iRacing? Well, rain, uh, rain is quite the project. It's a whole team initiative, really. It touches on every area of the product that you can imagine. Um, our, our dynamic track engineers, our artists, um, <laughs> our vehicle dynamics engineers, the tire physics, uh, our visual effects artists, um, our web engineers who need to develop the interfaces. Uh, so really it's all hands on deck. Uh, we've all been working at this um, for the last couple of years. That said, of course, we're balancing that with other projects, but um, we've made a, a ton of progress since we last spoke about this, um, oh, about a year ago. And we're getting really close to having something great. Uh, that said, uh, there's more work that needs to be done to get it up to our standards. I mean, oftentimes it's, it's said at iRacing that we can fall victim to over-engineering our features. Um, and that's true, certainly, to a degree, uh, perhaps with our rain. But we want to make sure that we do it right um, and that it's the best rain implementation and, and meets members' expectations, customers' expectations. And um, really, that it's a phenomenal experience that it adds it's to the racing experience of our customers and creates a new uh, element of course that we wouldn't deal with in the past new strategies um it's going to be phenomenal so keep keep stay tuned um uh, <laughs> stay tuned for sure we'll have more updates soon and um Hashtag it's going to be soon, awesome. Hashtag soon. Hashtag soon. I'm sorry. So to it's clarify, funny. we're not just grabbing the the old grip slider and pulling it down when it rains. No, no, it's not like uh, <laughs> no. For sure, that would have gotten it out the door quite quickly. Um, grip times like 0.5, but uh, <laughs> we're we're physically modeling so much that goes on in the real world uh, with the weather, the atmosphere, how rain actually is created. Um, the, the mix of humidity and uh, atmospherics that are required, the location of the track, the altitude of the track, the historical uh, data uh, that kind of sets precedence for how weather works in the, those regions. Uh, additionally, how the race cars uh, handle the, the wet track, the various levels of, of wetness, uh, the tire tread and how the tire kind of deals with water and uh, expels water through its channels. Um, how the racetrack itself uh, changes significantly based on whether it's dry or whether it's wet. I, I won't dive too much into detail on that. Um, some 
special sauce we're still working on. But for sure, in the real world, if you go to a racetrack in the dry, you're not going to be able to approach it the same way as in the wet. So get ready for that. Well, nice, nice segue. Speaking of approaching things in the same way, we have a new feature that we're planning for release in September. Hopefully, hopefully I didn't just jinx it. But Active Reset, this was kind of your brainchild, I believe. And that really, uh, I'll let you introduce, what exactly does that do? Yeah, well, uh, you could say that as my brainchild, I thought it was a cool original idea. But when I proposed it, I I brought it up to this engineer, Grant, uh, who's one of our key guys. And he's like, oh, yeah, I designed that in 1990 for as a mod for, uh, I forget, Grand Prix Legends or something. And then I when we announced it in a a podcast the other week, a bunch of our members were like, oh, yeah, I've wanted that forever. So regardless, it's going to be cool. Is that Um, a Grant voice? Did you just do Grant? That was, oh, no. There was a little I didn't... kiwi in there, I think. Was there? It was great, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Grant's uh, from hey, New, New Zealand. Stick to your day job there, Greg, so I don't know if you're going to do a voiceovers for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some of us have been known to, to try Grant voices, that's for sure. <laughs> um, so what Active Reset is, essentially, is it is a system that will, in testing mode, allow our racers our drivers to capture a moment in time um, and continue along down the the track as they might have otherwise, and then hit another button that will return them to that exact moment of time with all the state of their race car and the world around them being the same. Now you might ask, why would they want to do that? Well, there's a number of reasons, but one of the biggest reasons is um, learning. I mean, to learn a racetrack is really hard and not all of us have infinite time. Um, so this feature will give people the opportunity to practice sections of racetracks over and over again. Um, imagine you're at the Nürburgring Nordschleife, for example. Do you really want to put in a seven minute lap when you might only have a half hour to spare uh, for iRacing on, on a given evening uh, to learn one particular section that you have trouble with? Uh, so this will be a, a great tool for people to improve. Um, you can practice different things like getting off onto pit road, getting off of pit road. It doesn't even have to be sections of the racetrack or even the pur- purposes that we're thinking of. I'm sure people will come up with purposes and uses on their own. We figured um, out how to use it as an internal tool already, <laughs> to, especially with all the iterative stuff that we've been working on. It, was, it came to came to light for us internally at just the right time. Yeah, that was really smart. It saved some time on the production end, and well, that will result in faster delivery to all our our drivers and customers. Um, We are building this feature not only to be what I described, but also to be the foundation for a much larger offering. Um, I'm not going to dive too much in detail on what that might be, but I think people can connect the dots on... Uh, some ways we might, some directions we might go with um, experiences that can be played over and over again and situations uh, we might put people through for both learning and entertainment. Well, Twitter's going to be fun after this. Yeah. <laughs> all right. That's a, that was a pretty good tease, though. I like it. Yeah, that was that was great, but... All right, let's move on a little bit. Now, this is the this is where we do the uh, like the Diane Sawyer in deep, you know, see if we can make you cry. No, no I'm kidding. Uh, let's talk about your story. You know, you and Steve Myers have a really interesting story of how you got involved with with was was you no know, before iRacing even with Papyrus and whatnot, and you know, you guys started absolutely lowest possible level. And worked your ways up into being, uh, you know, a tandem that has really driven what iRacing is today in conjunction with some other people as well. Um, but it's a it's an excellent story of seeing, you know, how somebody can, you know, your career and how you've developed is, is, is pretty cool. So let's let's talk through this and just kind of roll with, you know, how, how did you get started in this crazy career of yours? Oh, yeah, sure. Um there's a lot to unpack there, but uh, I'll try to try to do it justice. And it was for sure um, not just myself, but a lot of people uh, were on this path that uh, really helped with my my growth 
and the trajectory I took. But really, um, from the time I was a kid, I, I was a kind of lifelong gamer and simulation fan. Um, and I, I mean, I grew up um, like idolizing, you know, the the big back in that era. There were like <clears throat> game designers that were like celebrities, um, like Miyamoto and um, John Carmack and, and all those guys. So I, I grew up wanting to become a, a game developer. Um, I was super into gaming. I, I I played tons of games growing up of, of all types. I was into racing games, shooters, um, some less serious games, some more serious games. I was like, I don't know if you guys remember Hard Driving, uh, the old <laughs> arcade game. I played the heck out of that. Um, Jaguar XJ220 was one of my my favorites growing up, all the way through to the more kind of like arcadey Ridge Racer. Um, on the more simulation side, I was a big fan of like F117A Stealth Fighter, if you guys remember that, and the Jane's Combat simulations. Oh, those are great. Yeah, just all all kinds of gaming simulation. I, I was a geek for growing up, and I was lucky. My my parents gave me the support, and the they got me the the Mac. They got me the, the Sega. It's let me follow that those passions. Um, when I got into college, um, I was really into competitive online gaming. Uh, so the late '90s. Uh, where that kind of scene was really starting to blossom with uh, shooters in, in particular, um, at least when it comes to like team uh, competition. And there were like, essentially it was the, to me, it felt like the foundation of esports, And in, in many ways, with the, tra the beginning of the trajectory for where we are today with esports, like competition systems, um, ranking systems, um, basically rules to keep people accountable. Um, so I was involved a lot in that. Uh, during that time, I was um, a computer science major at uh, BU, Boston University. And I also worked at Electronics Boutique in uh, the Watertown Mall at the time. It was one of those uh, in every mall across America back in the day, right? <laughs> for sure. Spent a lot of time in those. But in this capacity, I was stocking shelves, um, <laughs> but I, it was a great, really stroke of luck that this location uh, was kind of the hub for employees of Looking Glass Studios. Um, if anybody remembers them, they made the Thief games and Deuce X uh, and Impressions games and this company called Papyrus Racing Games. Uh, those folks all bought their games at this EB Games. And um, I was kind of like the PC gaming guy at EB Games, and I became friendly with, I mean, some folks at each of these studios. And I managed to talk my way into a summer job uh, doing QA at Papyrus. I was just a kid, basically. Um, but I was fortunate uh, and, and uh, got the opportunity, basically like an internship, and, and spent the summer finding bugs, uh, reporting issues, Pest, uh, pestering people with uh, things I found. Um, I know how that feels. I, I really yeah. <laughs> I, I was really fortunate, though, because I think maybe more than I should have, I really tried to understand game development, and I bugged programmers, I bugged artists, I bu bugged the production folks, and, and really tried to understand how they do what they do. Um, just beyond QA, um, and that led to future opportunities for sure. Uh, the next summer, after another semester or a couple semesters of college, I came back, continued pestering people, uh, learning more and more uh, until I was able to convince them to bring me on full time, uh, which they, thank goodness they did. Um, so uh, I kind of from there, uh, taken some opportunities, uh, fighting for some opportunities, uh, finding my way to, to do different things kind of outside of the scope of QA. I learned how to like make racetracks um, with my computer science background. Uh, I mean, I'm not a coder. Uh, I didn't really think I'd end up being a coder, but it gave me a good foundation to, to talk with those folks for sure. 
Um, and I had some really good guidance from uh, mentors when it comes to design and, and uh, how to design a game system or how to document uh, what, how a technical document essentially. So really I had the support of, of a lot of awesome folks throughout that process. Um, for, we mentioned Steve. So Steve is one of my uh, most longest term uh, associates. Uh, we go all, almost all the way back. He also joined Papyrus as a QA tester. And he also, uh, like myself, uh, pushed to constantly try to learn to, to new skills and take on new things. And between the two of us and, and some other folks, for sure, um, really QA became the farm team for, for future developers, and um, which is awesome. That's how a lot of people kind of become developers um, historically, and now we're seeing it even at iRacing. Um, we're, uh, we've got a super talented crew of, of QA folk, and um, some of them have, have started to actually become mini developers. Uh, and full, well, full-on developers, which has been amazing and rewarding to see. You have to have a good QA Steve Myers story. You know, everybody knows Steve is the, his Twitter personality, and you know the the big personality that he has. But you got to have a good one. Oh, for sure. Uh, Steve and I are uh, co-workers, collaborators. We've we've been in this together since almost the the beginning. Um, we've been through uh, thick and thin. Uh, hard times and, and good times throughout gosh how long has it been uh i'm i think i'm really old now that i think about this it's like working with steve myers will do that to you yeah uh, uh, that's certainly <laughs> true <laughs> i think late 90s um so steve also joined papyrus like i did as um, a qa tester um but he was also kind of aggressive like I was trying to fight for opportunities to try more things. Um, and we're both lucky that the company was uh, up for it, gave us those opportunities. I remember one of uh, his first really big kind of production projects that wasn't QA, but was actually development was the design uh, and implementation of uh, driving lessons or track tutorials for NASCAR racing 2002. We built this really awesome in sim in game tutorial editor. Um, and Steve was tasked with basically creating the, the guides. So uh, we were fortunate enough to get the participation of Daryl Waltrip and uh, get a, a basically Daryl to read our scripts and provide us with the material for those. And Steve's job was to cut up all those clips into those lessons. Now we had a lot of racetracks and that added up to a lot of dialogue. So <laughs> Steve uh, spent just days, weeks, months, cutting that up, listening to Daryl every day, all day. Uh, and Daryl was awesome. We were lucky to have him. Uh, but Steve, hearing anybody's singular voice all day, every day, uh, for weeks at a time, can kind of drive kind of drive <laughs> one mad. And I think it kind of drove Steve a little mad. He got a little loopy towards the end there, um, but he persevered, and those were really cool. A cool Did he feature. Did pick up that... a, a southern draw after that? No. <laughs> Steve with the southern draw scares me. <laughs> that is frightening. Um, geez, another one. I think it was NASCAR 2000. Jeez, I'm losing track of time. But the the Patriots were uh, in the playoffs, the snowball game. It also came at a, a time when we were in basically crunch um, towards the completion of uh, one of our box titles. Because back then we worked on box titles. Every year we'd push out a uh, basically a version of software, and well, we were all Patriots fans, and the QA manager wanted us to, well, this is a little rebellious, what I'm saying, saying here. The QA manager wanted us to, late at night on a, a snowy day to be doing smoke tests, but the freaking Patriots were playing the Raiders uh, in the snowball game, and, well, Steve said, hell no, 
we're gonna watch the snowball <laughs> game so he got our whole crew uh basically the leverage or, or the uh, the ability to go watch that game instead of loading up track after track after track for four hours until we fall asleep under our desks so <laughs> it's it's pretty awesome. We're going to have uh, to not let the rest of the staff hear this because yeah, they're going to yeah, rebel yeah. against you and Steve now and be like, ah, we're not going to test that. We're not that doing thing. that. Edit this out, please. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was that was crazy. Um, no, I mentioned that crunch. Um, that was a like, different era. So, well, maybe not for gaming in, in general, but for us, for sure. Back then, we used to exist, as everybody knows, box product to box product, um, NASCAR 3, NASCAR 4, NASCAR 2002, NASCAR 2003, et cetera, um, going NASCAR Legends. And it was rough because we were owned by a publisher uh, and that publisher operate, ran Papyrus essentially like you read about many publishers run game developers, game development studios these days. They staff them up in pre-production they work everybody hard, um, too hard, um, and then the game drops and they they fire a great number of them. And unfortunately, that was actually kind of the last several years of Pyrus were like that. Uh, we would work on these these new products. We'd come up with the designs. We'd do the pre-production, build up the staff, work like crazy, uh, and then ship it, and then bam. Uh, the shoe would drop and we'd lose a whole bunch of our fellow developers, our friends, and it, it was hard. Um, and it was demoralizing at times to try to like make good product while navigating that. Um, I mean, we, we persevered. Steve and I managed to nimbly dodge a number of these layoffs. Um, many of our friends didn't. Um, but it was really that experience when we formed iRacing and after Papyrus had been shut down, it was really important to us and, and to Dave and to uh, to all of us to create a sustainable culture uh, where we didn't run iRacing like that, like the, the publishers ran some other game studios. So I don't, we work super hard at iRacing. We're, I mean, we're always pushing, um, but we what we've built, we knew it had to be sustainable because the iRacing product as we all know, is sustainable. And it's something that um, needs to be worked on by people that really care and who are passionate about it. So hopefully we've built a good culture here. I, I think we have, um, but certainly part of that was informed by previous experience in the in the industry. Now, I'm not just saying this because you're here, but I mean, I, I, can, I feel like I speak for a lot of people. The culture at iRacing is fantastic. It is interesting, especially coming from my background, where people... Uh, relentlessly pursued excellence on a daily basis and i was given some mentorship as i transitioned from an athletic life into a professional life that that won't always be the case and you come to iRacing, racing and for the most part it is uh, and that makes life a little bit easier uh, because everybody here really cares this is not just a job to people everybody owns what they're working on uh, and so it's really cool to see so you moved out of QA, you've started to grab some other responsibilities or skills, I should say, not necessarily responsibilities. Um, and right about this, you're talking about, this is about the time, you know, Papyrus was shutting down and iRacing was opening up. So what did that look like from your lens? Um, well, at that point, I, well, the thing is with, iRacing, the foundation of iRacing was <clears throat> with John and, and Dave's backing, we were able to successfully purchase the source code for the basically GPL NASCAR racing code base. So we already knew that uh, some of the skill set that we've been building up over the years at Papyrus would be applicable. Um, so one of my first tasks was to essentially uh, build up an art department uh, together with some really talented, actually modders um, that we hired these Project Wildfire guys uh, who uh, were modders uh, of our product because of actually the decision Steve made to release, and it turned out to be a great decision, to release our sandbox tool, which is our track building tool, uh, to the community. And through that, we learned of some really talented artists and modders uh, who we later hired. 
So uh, together with them, kind of formed the initial art department and um, how we would make tracks and laser scanning and things like that flowed from that. Um, a lot of what I did also in the year, early years was building on some of the, the design stuff that uh, I picked up at Papyrus and actually working with Dave to build out and John um, and Steve, a whole bunch of us. But in terms of documentation, um, I took on basically documenting what is iRacing? How does iRacing work? Uh, what do the interfaces look like? How does the user interact with them? I guess uh, if we were to talk about it in today's terms, it kind of be user experience and systems design. Um, and in some shape or fashion, that turned out turned into what became the member site um, and really the foundation of how iRacing works with uh, competition and how people find races and, and, and all of that. Um, so balancing that with uh, art, which is one of my passions and, and production, still involved with that. Um, I mean, uh, th those were the first few years really. Um, I've always been involved with, or try to st stay involved with uh, our, our programmers and uh, working with them to make sure that, I mean, lot, tons of these projects that we work on with coders like are overlapping, like production and coders need to collaborate together. Um, so I certainly involved myself a lot in that, making sure that our production team had the, the support from the coders and the coders understood what the production team needed, also in terms of features. Um, so I kind of put myself in the middle of, of various departments and making sure that everybody has what they need to be successful um, and planning and all that. Of course, there's a lot more to it than that. Um, a lot of people involved in that, but um, just touching on my experiences, that's where I've spent a lot of time. And then I guess I mean, fast forward, you know, you have now and most recently uh, got the big promotion, executive producer of iRacing. Um, I mean, that's got to, I mean, looking back over the last, you know, what, 25 years, like I said at the beginning of this, even before we went on the air, that is, it's a really cool story about how, you know, doing things the hard way and doing things the right way can, can pay dividends. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, it was a hard road. I'm just, <laughs> it is super, it's fulfilling to be working at this company in any capacity. Um, and what we're working on is just so special. But yeah, I'm lucky to to be contributing uh, in the role I am contributing in and um, surrounded by such talented people, uh, smart people. I mean, smart, <laughs> artistically brilliant people. Uh, it's just awesome. And to be able to see uh, from the, the role I'm in, I get to kind of see a little bit of all of that. Um, which is really cool because every day there's a new challenge uh, that people are working on and uh, every day is fresh. Um, so it's, it's awesome. Like, I guess, as you said, Greg, um, I mean, it's kind of been a journey and uh, kind of something I hope to always do and uh, hoping to continue doing as long as I, I do a great job and uh, keep things going in the right direction. Well, I'd say things have been going pretty well, but thank you for making the time for us today. This has been fantastic to sit down and, and hear about your journey through the industry and through you know papyrus and iRacing and giving us a glimpse behind the curtain as well. Uh, it's been an absolute privilege and a pleasure. Um, I think we have a patch we have to get ready for now, though, don't we? Uh, that's certainly true, yeah. We have uh, some laps to turn. or Well, we've got our experts hard at, at work turning those laps, but let's hear what they say and uh, get that patch out. All right. one, one last question, Greg. Mm -hmm. Will you come back on the show sometime? I think I have a one-year grace period, don't I? Uh, we'll give you a I'll couple months off. Your, I'll yeah. check your contract. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll check it out. <laughs> well, so, hap happy, to, happy to join you guys. Um, there's any number of other subjects we can touch on that would be cool to just kind of jam on and, and explore. And It's really cool what we do. There's always lots to talk about. And uh, there's never any lack of new things uh, that are interesting to go over as well. Actually, I do have one last question. Why does Steve Myers call you the hammer? 
<laughs> okay. Well, um, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Sim racing wise, throughout the years, I've never been the fastest by any means. I mean, I think Steve can run laps around me on, on the virtual racetrack, but we did a number of years ago have um, a company outing, a track experience day at Thompson Speedway. And uh, we we're all, uh, late models, I think, are, are retired cup cars. Um, and we all went out on the track and, and I just found it to be something that was, I, I don't know, it just gelled with me. And I was um, turning laps around Steve, whereas uh, kind of turning tables. Uh, he, he was wondering, who's this guy who's blasting past me lap after lap? And we got off the car, out of the cars, and he was like, well, what? That doesn't make any sense. It's Greg. But so he gave me the nickname, The Hammer, because uh, I guess my foot was hammering down that gas pedal. <laughs> All right, well, everybody. Uh, once again, Greg Hill, executive vice president or vice president. What are you? Have, you have Greg the Hammer Hill. The Hammer Hill. Yes. You, Steve That's had, on the business card. He had the <laughs> longest job title for a while. I think your 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 business card's the longest one now. It's got all all of the titles on it. But executive vice vice president I racing. Um, thanks again for for making the time. And uh, yeah, let's go put a patch out and make things better. All right, let's do it. All right, back to the show. Well, always great to have a guest on the show, even better when it's somebody like Greg Hill, who is just an absolute treasure trove of knowledge, uh, institutional memory, all of the things that makes iRacing, you know, what it is. And he's a, an integral cog in this big machine that is iRacing. Uh, so looking forward to, uh, to... Yeah, we could have talked to him for hours, but he yeah. only had so many hours to, to share with us. But I, I think we'll definitely have him on again. He he agreed to that. Uh, Ish. And ish right um maybe not the next one but he'll be on again and and you know the three of us have kind of looked at the numbers uh, on the podcast and it is clear our listeners like to hear from from guests and in particular i racing guests so we're going to do our best to have somebody interesting on every one of these episodes um nobody to announce yet but we're working on some good names and there's tons of interesting people here at i racing so um doesn't matter what department, uh, people have cool backgrounds, how they got into this, what they do here at iRacing. It's all pretty unique. And so so look forward to that in the upcoming episode. Yeah, no doubt. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun to hear from all these different guests moving forward. I will also say, if you're listening to this on release day, iRacing Off-Road Championship Series, they let me put the plug in. The finale's at Crandon tonight. If you're listening after release day... It's in the YouTube playlist. Uh, anyway, don't... don't forget to rate, review, <laughs> oh, and subscribe. That's not nice. It's going to be a great race. <laughs> it's going to be a great race. It's some of the most exciting racing we have uh, on iRacing. Uh, well, we're going to bang in, flying through the air, mud going everywhere. It'll be a good race. Guaranteed. We're going to have some fun with them. Uh, Angela just popped in because apparently I didn't mute my uh, my Slack notifications, but that's funny since we talked about it at the beginning of the show. So let's we can leave that in. <laughs> Uh, week 13, we're uh, doing a, sp a special series of the Pro 2 trucks on short road courses. Uh, it is basically just drifting. The tiny that's truck is back? Uh, tiny not, the, truck. not the light. We're doing the full-powered version. Didn't we do tiny that in uh, the, the staff league a couple of years ago? We did those at some of the tracks. Yeah, I'm pretty, pretty sure some staff members didn't come back after that. <laughs> <laughs> that's a story for another time. Thanks for listening to uh, another edition of the iRacing Downshift. It just took six months. But don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Spreaker, anywhere else that Chris has put this thing. For Kevin Bobbitt, Chris Leone, I am Greg West, and we'll see you in the next episode, hopefully in the near future.